When you think about the Department of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, what comes to mind? Likely a certain conventional image. But the church is a global body with diverse traditions and people who lead them. Nowhere is this more apparent than the life story of the chair of Notre Dame's Department of Theology, Father Khaled Anatolios. In this episode of Notre Dame Stories, we explore one way the university embraces its Catholic character in the global context. Father Khaled, it's so great to be with you. Thank you for inviting us to your office. I'd love to start our conversation by asking you to share a little bit about your Notre Dame story. Sure. Um, well, I'm a, a theologian, a theologian who specializes particularly in early Christianity, um, and especially in early Christianity in dialogue with modern theology. Um, anybody who works in theology knows that uh, the Notre Dame Theology Department is one of the premier uh, departments in the world. And I was recently ranked number one, uh, and that happens frequently. Um, so I was well aware of the excellence of the faculty and the premier reputation of the department. Um, so it was a great honor and thrill to receive an invitation to uh, to come and join the faculty here. Um, and I, I, uh, it didn't take uh, much deliberation <laughs> to come to the conclusion that this would be uh, a wonderful place for me to continue my scholarly work. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. You are a Melkite priest. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for someone who's not familiar? Mm -hmm. And what was your journey like to get to what you're doing right now. The Melkite Church follows these Byzantine traditions, uh, and Byzantine refers to the, the, these traditions that grew up around that area, originating in that area, and then spread out. Um, so the Melkite Church follows these traditions, uh, but is in communion with the Bishop of Rome. Um, and we, we pray the, uh, the Pope, we pray for the Pope during the liturgy. Um, and that means we have intercommunion. And specifically, the Melkite Church is, the, is a Byzantine Catholic Church that has its origins in the Middle East. So, so originally, Melkite Christians um, uh, come from the Middle East, from countries like uh, principally Syria, uh, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt. So what was the process to become a priest like? for you, because if you're looking at mm -hmm. the world through the lens of Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. how you came to the priesthood is very different than what we might typically expect. So that was quite a, a shock, and, uh, um, and I thought about it, I agitated about it, um, I, I found uh, many reasons for not accepting that invitation. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was uh, f terrified, frankly. Um, and so in many ways I was reluctant, and I, and I, uh, uh, but I prayed about it, and um, you know, all, I brought out all my objections in prayer. And at the end of the day, you know, I had a very wise spiritual director who took me through, guided me through the whole process. And you know, at the end he convinced me, you know, if, if he said, like, if you had thought of this on your own, then we could worry, like, is mm -hmm. this a good idea or not? But you were called by the bishop, and so you're called by the church in the name, uh, uh, in the person of the bishop. And so um, we, we know you have an invitation from the church, and it's always better to say yes than no. <laughs> and I was finally uh, reconciled to that, and... and uh, and I've received many blessings as a priest and do not at all regret it. It's a great responsibility that you have embraced and that your family embraced yeah, as yeah, well as we right. look at these um, similarities and differences between Roman Catholicism right. and Eastern right. Catholic traditions. Mm -hmm. You were married, you have a family, mm -hmm. now your children are involved yeah. in, in your ministry. Were they quick to embrace this experience? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, because in class, you know, people see me sort of looking like a priest and so on. Then I have to warn them right away, <laughs> you know, don't be scandalized. You know, I'm a priest, but I'm a married priest. It's legit. It's canonical. Everything's mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so, yeah, but, you know, for me, um, you know, my family is, is completely involved in my ministry and I, and I couldn't do it without them. You know, I, I certainly couldn't do it in the same way. Even in the calling to the priesthood, um, you know, my, my wife, uh, Huria, we refer to the priest's wife in Arabic mm -hmm. as, as Huria, Huria Meredith. Um, uh, you know, she was on board a lot quicker than I was, <laughs> you know. So I had all this endless agitation and so on. Um, and I was afraid to tell her, you know, what the bishop said and, you know, all the, you know, uh, I was worried about how she would receive that and so on. Um, but she was very peaceful. She's like, oh, yeah, I expected that all along. You know, I wow. thought this, this was bound to happen. I always thought that this was going to happen. So she was very calm and collected, mm -hmm. you know, and totally received it while I was freaking out, you know. So, so that helped me a lot. You know, we have to come in an hour before liturgy and transform the chapel, which is regularly a Roman Catholic chapel, into a Byzantine chapel. And we have to move the chairs and roll out the icons and um, put different altar cloths and so on. So, um, you know, my younger children, Sarah and Rebecca, they, they come um, with minimal complaining, <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, requiring, you know, slight bribery, but they come and they, they do the work, you know, and they're great. And, um, and it's also one of, one of the blessings of me being a, a married priest, I get plenty of homily feedback. Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> yeah. So I, I recently published a book of homilies and dedicated to Sarah and Rebecca, you know, in, in, in gratitude and recognition for their, uh, benevolent, gentle critiques of, of, my, of my sermons. Yeah. How beautiful. Yeah. Let's, let's so it's definitely a family endeavor, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. From your perspective, why is it so important, maybe especially at a place like Notre Dame, mm -hmm. to represent the Eastern Catholic traditions mm -hmm. in addition to the Roman Catholic traditions? Right. So, you know, I was ordained um, in 2015 um, back in Boston. And then when I was offered this, this position here at Notre Dame, I, I spoke with my bishop, um, and he saw this as a great opportunity. Um, so he recalled to me uh, the words of uh, John Paul II, you know, who said that the Eastern and Western traditions as the two lungs of the church. And he said... Uh, the Catholic Church has to breathe with both lungs. Um, and so Bishop Nicholas said, okay, so let's see how God is working here, that you've been invited to one of the greatest Catholic universities in the world, you know, maybe the greatest. And, and so now you have a chance to go uh, and help the University of Notre Dame breathe with both lungs. So that Notre Dame <coughs> could be um, not just a Roman Catholic university, though it has its origin specifically in the Roman Catholic tradition, and, and uh, very richly so, but so Notre Dame can become fully Catholic and can breathe with both lungs. Um, so that's a, that was a, um, a, a great invitation for me, and, and it's been wonderful seeing that uh, transpire um, in, in my time here. Notre Dame is also a leading research university, and we, all, we don't always think of that in terms of theology, but there is scholarly rigor that comes um, with studying theology for our students. What would you say is your role, or more broadly your department's role, in accompanying students as they study and seek to understand their mm -hmm. faith? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So I regularly teach our introductory class, which uh, all freshmen uh, have to take at Notre Dame, Foundations of Theology. And a frequent reaction I get at the end of the class, uh, whether live or, or in student evaluations, people will say to me, wow, I never thought 
that you could actually think about your faith. Um, I always thought, well, faith, you just accept it, you believe it, you memorize some things, some phrases that you don't understand, you don't have to understand, and, um, and thinking is for other things than, than faith. Um, of course, that, that's really not um, accurate at all. It's not true to uh, how, we un how we understand uh, uh, and, and receive Christian faith. So I think that theology department at Catholic University has an important task, not just of teaching about faith, and not even just about uh, uh, thinking about faith in a, in, a, in a reasonable mode, you know, faith-seeking understanding, um, but just as much relating the, the thinking about faith to the thinking about everything else, mm -hmm. relating theology to history and to sociology and to physics and to biology and so on. Let's talk about the Mass, the Byzantine liturgy and the Mass that you celebrate. Um, I loved joining you for Mass a few yeah, weeks ago. It's fascinating um, to explore the differences, mm -hmm. one of which would be um, chanting, a lot mm -hmm. of movement, but I right. would love for you to, to describe in your words mm -hmm. um, what is Mass like, particularly as we contrast it with a Roman Catholic Mass. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? It is fundamentally, essentially the same liturgy. Mm -hmm. Um, there are structural similarities that everyone familiar with the Roman liturgy would, would recognize. There's the liturgy of the Word that culminates in the reading of the Gospel. There's a the liturgy of the Eucharist um, that, that culminates in Holy Communion. Doctrinally, it's, it's, we believe that this, the same thing is happening, you know, that the risen Lord is present, fully present. As you intimated, you know, one, one difference is the impact on the senses. It's, it's a, um, you know, the sensory experience is, um, is, is maybe more intense, you know, so there's the constant chanting, as you said, the icons, you know, that appeal to the, to the, to the vision. The incense symbolizing the, you know a rising of our, of our prayer to God, uh, the bodily motions, you know the, the frequent making the sign of the cross and the the bowing and sometimes the, the prostrations, um, and also you know another important structural difference that that belongs specifically to the to the Byzantine liturgy um, is uh, the processions. So there's a lot of uh, you know, sensory impact. Our Father and Bishop Francois, our Father and Bishop Kevin, that the Lord God may remember them in his kingdom at all. Mm -hmm. all those who are unseen in the sight of the world, that we may transmit Christ's loving gaze to them and to all our suffering, now and always and forever and ever. For me, you know, my, my experience with the Byzantine liturgy, I think in one word, has always been theophany, mm. you know, which means the appearance of God, like God shows up, you know. Um, and, you know, just like Moses on the burning bush, you know, or uh, Moses on the mountain, um, or the vision of the prophet I Isaiah, you know, we, we come for liturgy, and it's not so much like we do this and we do that and we ask this and we wait for that, but it's just we come to the liturgy and then God appears, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just everything is theophany, everything is, is God appearing, speaking, acting out, manifesting himself. People are showing up as well. Yes. As I understand, mm -hmm. you started offering the Byzantine Mass mm -hmm. to make sure our campus community could experience that. Mm -hmm. And what that has grown into mm -hmm. now are Sunday services filled with literally people of all ages, mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. students, yes, young families from the community. Mm -hmm. What has that been like? For you to create this community, yeah, it's it's been wonderful for the Holy Spirit to create this community. Um, yeah, you know, it's been wonderfully gratifying. Um, 
Um, you know, the, the church is the communion of humanity in, in God uh, and in Christ. And we have a beautiful communion here, you know, with, like you said, undergrad students, graduate students, faculty, faculty from different departments, not just from theology, people from the community. Um, and everybody has their stories, you know, um, and, and every story is beautiful and infinitely valuable in itself. But there are people who are uh, Roman Catholic, they've never experienced the Byzantine liturgy, and so they hear about it and they come and they enjoy it. And, um, and some come and go. One of the, 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 the great blessings, you know, we've been doing this since 2016, starting out once a month and now every week during the academic year. There has, every single liturgy we've ever had has had some new person who's never mm. shown up before. That's been a constant, and it's amazing to me. Um, so, so we have people experiencing Byzantine liturgy for the first time. Uh, we have people who are Eastern Catholic, whether Melkite or another, belong to another Eastern Catholic church. Um, and, so, and so they come here to, to pray in a way that they're used to. Um, or sometimes they've had some experience in the past, and, and, and having liturgy on campus allows them to reconnect with that. Um, so right now, in a present liturgy, you have people who you know, trace their ethnicity to the Middle East, to, to Palestine, to Iraq, um, and uh, uh, Germany, you know, other, other places, Slavic countries, um, from people, as you said, from inside the university, from outside the university, and from uh, different constituencies within the university. So it's a very rich and community. As we close, I'd love to invite you to share any, anything you've learned in your own mm -hmm. personal journey, mm -hmm. in your ministry, in your time here at Notre Dame, about God, mm -hmm. or how has your own relationship with Jesus grown through this time? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, I think the, the blessing of, of, of loving people in, in a new and different and deeper way in Christ uh, as a priest. Um, you know, there are different experiences of human love, the love of a child for parents, you know, romantic love, the love of a parent for a child. And, um, and, and each of these loves is new. But I've experienced really a new kind of love as a priest, you know, in, in um, you know, the, the call to love people in Christ and... Um, to hold the, the congregation in my heart as I offer the liturgy at the altar um, <clears throat> while they hold me in their heart and their prayer, you know, in our offering of the liturgy. Um, so I, I vividly felt this call to, to love people in, in, in Christ. Um, I, I feel I've, I've grown in that, you know, despite my deficiencies. Um, but also a, a, a greater and more vivid love of Scripture, um, which has been evoked by the, the call to preach. You know, so the, the call to preach on, is, is a call to um, proclaim and expound the Word of God in Scripture. Um, so, and I feel that has really helped me grow as a, as a Christian disciple, as a theologian. I remember also this very wise spiritual director, um, uh, may he rest in peace, God bless him, Father John Connolly. And w d during our discernment, he, he said, um, he said, being a, 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 he said, you know, trust in God and being a theologian will make you a better priest and being a priest will make you a better theologian. And I can say I've experienced that. Um, and then finally, I would say, you know, learning to, to constantly repent, knowing my inadequacies, um, uh, and, and asking for, for forgiveness um, um, so to grow in repentance that, that's also a gift Father Khaled, thank you we appreciate your time and your willingness to teach us so thank, thank you, you very much and uh, thank you for your hospitality and for your enthusiasm and encouragement Excellent. thank you, God bless
Thanks for joining us for Notre Dame Stories, the official podcast of the University of Notre Dame. Find us on stories.nd.edu and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Notre Dame Stories is created by the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. It's written and produced by Andy Fuller with content coordination from Stacey Stikovich. This episode was edited by Michael Weens and Jessica Seif with videography by Tony Fuller and Zach Dudka. Original music is by Alex Mansour, and I'm your host, Jenna Liberto.